Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Khalil Jashan. I'm executive director of Arab Center Washington. I'd like to welcome uh, all of you uh, to this panel uh, dedicated to the topic of U.S. policy reversal uh, on uh, Israeli uh, settlements. Thank you for being here today. Uh, as you know, uh, on Monday, uh, in a kind of surrealistic uh, press conference of some sort, uh, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo uh, took the stage and uh, announced that uh, after careful study of all sides uh, of the legal uh, debate regarding settlements uh, in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, uh, came to the conclusion uh, in agreement with a previous, I guess, uh, statement in U.S. history by President Reagan uh, expressing his personal perspective, which, by the way, never became uh, an administration uh, policy at the time. Uh, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo declared that the establishment of civilian Israeli uh, settlements or Israeli civilian settlements in the West Bank is not per se inconsistent with international uh, law. In looking uh, in the room here, I see at least a couple of you that are all timers like myself. Uh, today actually marks, or this week, marks my 50th anniversary as both a student and uh, a professional in analyzing uh, US policy. And I've seen a lot of statements over those five decades. And uh, I would like to claim a little bit of expertise in, in uh, deciding whether the the policy is as a, as a result of careful study or not. I doubt that this particular statement was the result, as the secretary announced, uh, of careful, even-handed study by the experts. It, it, it smacks, actually, the opposite, uh, as ad hoc statement rushed uh, without a careful uh, study. Uh, the statement itself, with regards to the settlement, is vague. I don't know what the secretary means, whether this is the legal or the normal English language use of the term per se. But when we say it is not per se inconsistent, what does that mean? That in reality it is, or in reality it is not? You could interpret it legally at least uh, in, in b both, both ways. So the statement left uh, a lot uh, to be answered. Uh, the same thing with regard to the objective stating that the statement has nothing to do uh, actually with the domestic situation here at home or uh, in Israel, yet uh, I'm, I'm not sure that is uh, th the case. And then he announced that, uh, uh, that the uh, US uh, statement or his statement uh, does not actually uh, address or prejudge uh, the final status uh, of settlements. Then, then you know, why do it? It begs uh, uh, to be asked, uh, if that's the case, uh, then what's the purpose of this whole uh, exercise? Uh, since then, the reaction has been actually uh, broad, deep, and mostly negative with regards to the statement, both in the region and so on, uh, there, except for the, of course, uh, the statement uh, welcoming that from uh, Netanyahu before he got indicted. Uh, yesterday, and maybe that was the purpose of the statement anyway, to try to throw him uh, some kind of a rope here. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the reaction at least uh, here at home and abroad with regards to neutral parties uh, has been somewhat negative. For those of you who didn't notice, uh, this morning uh, Congress released a letter uh, addressed to the Secretary signed by more than 106 members uh, of the House basically uh, disagreeing with him, denouncing uh, the statement uh, that, uh, that he made. Uh, they are uh, all Democrats, uh, unfortunately, but hopefully there will be additional names uh, down, uh, down the road. And um, the general sentiment has been, uh, including, by the way, the, uh, the UN Security Council, you know, all uh, 14 members, as aside from the US, uh, chastise actually uh, the U.S. for taking that position because they viewed it as contrary to uh, international <coughs> law, unlike uh, what the Secretary announced. The same thing happened with our closest allies in Europe, uh, spokespeople for the EU, uh, various ambassadors uh, uh, of uh, member countries uh, in the EU also, in addition, made their own uh, statements but declared unequivocally 
uh, that Israeli statements uh, in the West Bank are contrary to international law uh, the way uh, they perceive, uh, perceive that. So the, the reaction, any way you look at it, whether at home or abroad, has been somewhat uh, uh, negative. Of course, the arguments you're familiar with, which we will be talking about uh, today with regards to, first of all, undermining uh, U.S. credibility uh, in the region, uh, maybe even affecting uh, U.S. ability to intervene in the future as a potential, uh, if you will, mediator. Uh, in trying to find a solution uh, to the uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, 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 conflict. So with that in mind, uh, in mind I'll stop here and uh, pass the microphone to my colleague, Dr. Tamara Kharoub, who is the Assistant Executive uh, Director uh, for the Center. She will be moderating the panel. She will introduce the speakers uh, and, and continue to uh, chair uh, the panel. Again, welcome. and. Uh, Tamara, the microphone is yours. And thank you all for joining us today on this uh, Friday afternoon, um, rainy Friday afternoon, if I may add, to discuss uh, this important development uh, that Khalil uh, described. Um, this proclamation by uh, Secretary Pompeo, uh, in my view, brings up three main issues or a set of questions. Uh, the first one is legal. Um, Pompeo laid out the reasoning claiming that the, the Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank um, are inconsistent with, uh, as inconsistent with international law, does not serve the cause of peace, but also he altogether dismissed international law. Uh, the questions here, um, you know, are, is international law really up for inter interpretation uh, in this regard? What is the legal status of, of the settlements? And why is international law important in this context? The second set of questions has to do with U.S. policy towards Palestine, Israel. Um, although, as uh, many of you uh, would think, uh, this move is not surprising by the Trump administration. It follows several um, announcements that are along the same lines. But um, many did consider this a reversal in, in U.S. policy. And that's referring to um, the legal State Department opinion of 1978. But on the other hand, others have argued this, this is mostly rhetoric, and this is, in fact, consistent with um, decades of U.S. action, or rather inaction, with regard to the settlements. Um, and no U.S. administration since President Carter has explicitly referred to the settlements as illegal. Uh, but unlike this administration, most administrations, previous administrations, have considered them uh, an obstacle to peace. So what is the, the rationale behind this by the Trump administration? What is the significance of the timing, both with regard to U.S. politics and Israeli politics? Um, is this an indication or a signal for the um, yet-to-be-released, or if-to-be-released um, Trump administration peace plan? Um, and needless to say, there, there remains no room for, for a two-state solution uh, after this or even before this. Um, but what are the political and legal implications um, for U.S. policy towards Palestine, Israel? And are these measures uh, reversible by future administrations, or a future administration, hopefully, in, in 2020? And what is the significance of the letter sent by uh, members of Congress to, to Secretary Pompeo that Khalil talked about? And the third uh, set of questions that I would like to pose uh, has to do with uh, impact. So what, while this announcement may not have immediate uh, implications, previous decrees by the Trump administration um, have, in fact, emboldened uh, the Israeli government and the settler movement to um, expand and accelerate settlement exp expansion and construction, and uh, as well as demolitions of homes and evictions of Palestinians from their property. So what is the impact um, on the national, legal, and human rights of Palestinians? Um, what are the implications for any peace deal in the future, not necessarily the Trump administration's peace plan, but any peace plan? Um, and is there potential for a larger role to be played by the international community at this point? What's the significance of the recent rebuke by the 14 other members of the security, uh, the UN Security Council? Uh, to answer these questions, hopefully all of them, but maybe more, <laughs> We have a great panel of experts. Thanks to all three of you for being here today. Um, special thanks to Lara for, for joining us. She just landed this morning uh, from a uh, trip in, to Palestine, Israel. So we appreciate you joining us despite being jet lagged and on such short notice. 
Um, I will introduce them briefly in speaking order. Uh, Jonathan Kitab is a Palestinian human rights lawyer, and he's also a non-resident fellow here at Arab Center, Washington, D.C. Yusuf Munayir is the executive director of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights and is also a non-resident fellow at Arab Center, Washington, D.C. Uh, Laura Friedman is the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Um, you can find their full bios in um, the program that you may have picked up on your way in. Uh, thank you to all three of you for joining us to discuss this important development. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone what Khalil um, already said. Uh, we use cards for our uh, Q&A session. Uh, they are on the table in front of you. There are pencils as well. Uh, please uh, use those to ask your questions. Um, write legibly. It's Friday afternoon. My ability to decipher handwritings has diminished. Um, identify your um, name and affiliation. And if you're addressing your question to one of the panelists, you may also um, specify that. Um, and with that, uh, we can start the discussion. I will give each one of the speakers about 12 to 15 minutes to present their remarks, and then we will be taking questions. I would like to start with Jonathan and the legal dimension. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Uh, I have been following the issue of settlements uh, from the legal point of view and uh, particularly international law uh, for many years. It seemed to me this is one of the clearest, least controversial uh, issues on which there is basically a consensus of the international scholars and the international community. Uh, there's three reasons for that. First, the text of the Geneva Conventions, as well as the authoritative interpretation by John Piquet on that issue, is very clear. You cannot move your civilian population into uh, land that is under belligerent occupation. And you cannot remove the population, the civilian population, out of the occupied territories. The, the, the text, the provisions of the Geneva Convention are clear and unequivocal. In fact, they state that such settlement activity constitutes a grave breach of the Geneva Convention, for which there is no excuse. In other words, you cannot justify it. Secondly, the issue has already been litigated at the highest level by the International uh, Court of Justice at The Hague. Which, which came up with a unanimous decision. The decision was actually 14 to 1 on the issue of the wall. But on this specific matter, on the applicability of the Geneva Convention and the illegality of settlements, the one single dissenting judge joined the majority. So really, it is a uh, unanimous decision. And uh, for us Americans, we know how difficult it is to get the U.S. Supreme Court of seven judges to have a unanimous decision. Most of the decisions are four to three, five to two. But to have 15 respected international jurists from different countries and different legal traditions study the matter and unanimously say on this issue, International law is clear. So there's very little to discuss. Third, and perhaps most importantly, if we understand why this law came about, why don't we want any country to move its civilian population into occupied territories? It's obvious, because that complicates tremendously the effort to keep international peace, and to restore the situation to what it used to be before, because now you have to deal with children, women, uh, graveyards, uh, schools. You have to uproot, in other words, a civilian population just to restore the status quo ante. So international law is very clear that it doesn't want to accept, to allow even the possibility and therefore the temptation for any country to start a war in order to assert its sovereign claims over somebody else's territory. Now you say maybe there are 
historical, religious, uh, tribal, ethnic, whatever reasons for countries to claim territories of their neighbors. And that's true, because you have over 190 countries, and many of their lines have been drawn arbitrarily. So unless you have a firm principle that you cannot take over territory by force, and you cannot move your civilian population into or out of it, is basically the bedrock of international law since the Second World War. And it's worked. There have only been three instances of attempts to violate it. One was by Iraq, which claimed Kuwait to be part of its historical background with the 19th province, as you remember, the 19th governate. And the inter entire international community says, that is wrong, you cannot do that. You cannot occupy another uh, country by force. Uh, secondly, uh, the Russians uh, with the Ukraine and the Crimea. And again, the international community was uh, unanimous in saying that that is not allowed. And the third has been Israel, which has tried to annex, whether it's Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, or uh, part or all of the West Bank, and to move settlements in it, uh, that is what we have here today. So it is, it is not a controversial issue. From the legal point of view, it is absolutely clear. Now you can ask, why then do the Israelis do it, or what justifications do they have? I've, I've made a study of the different excuses that have been used, and I think the center uh, is, is publishing it. It's available on uh, the website. What are the arguments, the legal arguments, that Israel has used to justify the settlements under international law? Most of these arguments have been presented before the Israeli high court itself. Uh, that's why being a member of the Israeli bar, speaking Hebrew, I, I could follow all these arguments as well as the public debates. Uh, I, I will try to summarize them briefly, but you can find them all there. First, they said that these, uh, we really are applying the Geneva Conventions, but only the humanitarian provisions, not the political ones. And settlements have to do with politics, not humanitarian. That's why we're not applying it. Then they said, well, these provisions only apply uh, when the territory comes under your control uh, is uh, under aggressive war. We, this was a defensive war. And therefore, a different set of laws apply. Well, international law doesn't recognize anything like that. Uh, then they said, uh, these provisions only apply to forced transfer of population, uh, like the Nazis did, forced marshes and the like. Well, and, and these settlers are going there of their own free will. And therefore, the Geneva Conventions don't apply, and they're not really. Again, international law doesn't accept that type of uh, justification. Then they came up with a fourth one, that the Geneva Conventions and the prohibition on moving settlements only applies when there's another sovereign there. This land didn't have a sovereign. Egypt was only administering those lands, and Jordan's claim to sovereignty is nebulous. Only Pakistan and Britain accepted it. They don't talk about uh, Syria, of course, and the Golan Heights. Uh, and therefore, this really doesn't apply. Again, uh, that claim has very little weight in international law, uh, because that's not what the international law says. Uh, apart from the fact that Israel's own claim uh, to legitimacy in West Jerusalem has the same claim as uh, Jordan's uh, in, in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Then there was a, a fifth argument that was presented by Yuda Bloom. It's called the missing reversioner. Basically, it says where there is no other sovereign, again, it flows from the previous argument, where there is no other sovereign, you have to look back to who originally had sovereignty. And since nobody else originally had sovereignty, the only real sovereign is the Jewish people. They are the missing reversioner. 
because 2,500 years ago, they used to have uh, a state there, uh, and they used to be sovereign, and therefore they are, it reverts back to them. They are the missing uh, reversioner. Again, not a single international legal authority other than Israel itself uh, has, has accepted this, this really strange uh, idea. And not to mention the fact that many other uh, countries, modern countries, can claim to have had sovereign rule over Palestine. Everybody from Turkey to Greece to Italy to Iraq to Syria to Iran to Egypt, you, you name it, because it's right in the middle. So everybody else, uh, Saudi Arabia also, everybody else had at one time or another uh, ruled Palestine and could claim uh, to be the ruler. That leaves perhaps the last and maybe the only significant argument that they have. We're here, we took it, we established facts on the ground, eventually people will accept it, even the Palestinians themselves will accept it. It's reality, force. Now, sometimes that argument is made pretty by saying what's really important is peace, not international law. And since talking about settlements doesn't advance the cause of peace, let's not talk about international law. Let's concentrate on peace and the peace uh, process. Uh, the truth is that this argument, which perhaps finds some echo in the current administration, that if we're strong, if we can do it, we'll do it, and who cares about international law? That's not what's important. The danger with this argument is that it uh, brings us back to the rule of the jungle. It basically eliminates international law and the international community. It basically says if you're strong enough and you can do it and you can uh, enforce that law, you can create new realities. And it becomes particularly dangerous when you're using civilians as your tools. When you move civilians, again, nobody is questioning uh, Israel's right to, once it conquered the West Bank and Gaza, to have its army have bases until peace comes. But when you're moving civilians and they're settling there with their swimming uh, pools, with their homes, with their clothesline, with their schools, with their graveyards, and they're civilians, then you are really almost saying to remove us to create acceptance of international law, you have to create a lot of human civilian suffering by innocent people. So this, this is what really makes the current uh, announcement by the uh, Secretary of State so dangerous. It's basically it's saying, let's forget about international law. Let's forget about the international community. Let's just whatever is, is. Let's be realistic and accept the rule of force. The Israelis are strong. They won. They took it. They moved in. International law is really basically irrelevant. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, we move on to Yusuf. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Yes? OK, great. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, uh, Tamar and Khalil and everyone for, um, for being here today. Um, I really appreciate your, your comments and where you left off. I want to talk a little bit about um, the statement itself uh, by Secretary Pompeo, um, uh, how to interpret some of the elements in it, um, the, the optics of it, what it means, uh, and, uh, and also think about an interpretation of, um, of the impact that might be a little bit different than the, the sort of conventional uh, wisdom that, that we've, we've heard. Uh, when you look at the announcement itself, it falls in line with something we've seen repeatedly from this administration. Uh, Pompeo characterized the decision as one that was um, a reversal uh, of uh, previous administration policy. 
uh, and one of the things that the Trump administration has promised to its supporters uh, is a rollback of everything that uh, President Obama did. And of course, we know that among the uh, Trump base, there is tremendous suspicion uh, of the previous administration, what their intentions were, whether they were really working in the American interest, uh, especially when it comes to the uh, question of Israel and Palestine and broader engagement with the, with the Arab and, uh, and Muslim world. And so this has fallen in line with a number of different steps beyond just foreign policy, where the Trump administration is uh, reversing what the Obama administration and other Democrats have done. And in the framing of the uh, statement that was presented by Secretary Pompeo, he began by talking about how this was originally done by uh, the administration of President Carter, a Democrat, uh, President Reagan, the Republican didn't really agree with him, although he didn't go as far as uh, issuing a different uh, legal opinion um, and so on. But it was definitely framed by Pompeo as a donkeys and elephants, Democrats, Republicans type of uh, 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 issue. Uh, and I think that there are others on the other side who also want to present it in a very similar way. Uh, folks who uh, want to interpret this as part of a Republican effort, and it is certainly part of a Republican effort, but one that is somehow fundamentally different than Democratic administrations and their practice over uh, previous years. Uh, and the danger, I think, in this interpretation is it leads to a sense that uh, should there be a change in administration, that there will be some sort of return to normal, in which case U.S. policy towards settlements will actually look fundamentally different. And I don't think that that's true at all. And I think when you look at previous American policy, uh, what you see in the statement from Pompeo is uh, very much a distinction without a difference in practice. Uh, and while um, the previous administration, the Obama administration, uh, used the language around the legitimacy of Israeli settlements, their language was, we will no longer recognize the legitimacy of further settlement expansion, they were very careful to avoid legal framing. Uh, and the reason for that is, and this is, this, this is very important and it is consistent with practice across the, uh, the party line uh, in, uh, in the White House, is that what U.S. policy has really been towards the peace process, uh, and this, I think, existed during Carter's administration and began before it, was that the role of the United States was to dominate the peace process and to keep the peace process under the purview of the United States and importantly outside the purview of international institutions, the United Nations and elsewhere. This is the reason why the Obama administration, which of course Secretary Pompeo would like us to think was radically different on, on its approach to settlements, uh, vetoed a 2011 United Nations Security Council resolution which condemned Israeli settlements as illegal and was of course the only no vote uh, on, that, uh, uh, on that resolution. And I would encourage folks to go back and read the statements and explanation by Secretary Rice uh, at the time, Susan Rice in 2011, around why it was that they decided to veto uh, the resolution. And what they said is, of course, repeating again the line around legitimacy, repeating again the issue of an obstacle to peace. But importantly, what she said was, anything that the United States do does on this question needs to be measured up against the fundamental test. Does it advance the peace process or does it not? And here is, I think, the real crux of the issue, uh, which uh, is not really much different from this administration to the previous one. And that is that administrations, White House administrations, have looked at international law and specifically accountability for Israeli violations of international law as something that is fundamentally separate and inherently opposed to the advance of peace. And nothing, of course, could be further from the truth. Uh, and I think this is one of the things that has complicated American uh, uh, you know, uh, credibility and, of course, capacity to make peacemaking. Accountability and justice are not antithetical to peace. They're, of course, prerequisites for peace. Uh, and I think that moving forward, if there is to be real change, it cannot be a change that is a return to the status quo ante, uh, but one that understands that accountability for violations of international law uh, by the Israelis or really anyone uh, is antithetical to peace and has to be addressed uh, if peace is to be advanced. I also want to talk about um, a couple of other things related to the announcement itself. One of them is the timing of it. 
what was that all about? Um, we had a very sensitive moment happening in Israeli domestic politics. For those who have been following Israeli domestic politics, uh, they've had two elections this year. Neither of them have resulted in a government. Uh, the uh, party led by Benjamin Netanyahu was handed the mandate twice after the first election and after the second election to attempt to form a government with a majority of uh, members of the parliament. That failed the second time around, and his opponent uh, was handed the mandate to do that and was closing in at, at the very end of the deadline when this, uh, uh, when this uh, announcement was made. And this announcement falls in line with others that have been made by the Trump administration that were essentially gifts to Benjamin Netanyahu in attempts to strengthen his hand in Israeli domestic politics. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has made the case repeatedly uh, for a decade now to Israeli voters that I am the only one that can get the United States to do what really needs to be done for Israel to benefit. I am the one that can make Congress stand up and cheer for me more than they cheer for the President of the United States. No other representative, no other leader of Israel can possibly have the impact on uh, the United States, the greatest strategic asset that Israel has that I, Benjamin Netanyahu, can have. And so the Trump administration has been helping him deliver uh, to Israeli voters uh, one uh, propaganda coup after the other, whether it was the announcement around Jerusalem, the announcement around Golan, the announcement now around uh, the uh, settlement issue. So I think the timing of this was um, very suspicious and once again related to the situation on, uh, on the ground. The last thing I will say about the statement in particular uh, is I, I Notice that when we talked about the language, you mentioned this. What, is, what does it mean to say not inconsistent with international law per se? Uh, one of the things that uh, I noted in uh, Pompeo's comments was, uh, and this may have been in his comments or when he was pressed by journalists, was his specific mention of the Israeli court system. Uh, and I think that this is important because there, there have been situations where the Israeli court system has found that specific settlements, specific outposts, are illegal under Israeli law. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that he was doing here, which w was wanting to give deference to the Israeli court system in making determinations over what is legal and what is illegal. And I think that part of that is uh, a desire not to step on the toes of what the United States considers a sovereign government and their independent institutions, but also very dangerously sending a message to the world that it's the Israelis that get to, to decide what is legal and what is not legal in the territory that they control. Uh, and that, I think, is a very dangerous message that needs to be underscored and probably what was really meant by per se and, and, and so on, is that they did not want to put limitations on the Israeli court's ability to make determinations about what makes sense uh, uh, in the Israeli context. Um, the last thing I will, I will say in, on the response to this, and uh, you mentioned, and Tamar, you mentioned uh, the letter from 106 members of, uh, of Congress, all Democrats. My immediate reaction to that is, why just 106? Uh, you know, this is, this is as, as you laid out, Jonathan, one of the least controversial things in, in the entire conversation on Israel-Palestine is the illegality of settlements under international law. And yet there were only 106 Democrats, entirely Democrats. And I think what this points to is that there, that there, is, a, there is a divide even among Democrats on this issue. And I would recall here a resolution that was advanced earlier this year. Uh, which I believe was HRES 326. It was a, 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 a sense of Congress resolution uh, that was simply intended to say that the United States believes that a two-state solution is the, is, is the way to move forward. The initial language of that resolution, which could not garner the entirety of the Democratic caucus, okay, had the word occupation in it. And it was only when the uh, sponsoring member uh, sent in an amendment, removed the language of occupation from the actual text that you saw a much larger number of Democrats willing to join. And I think what this shows you is that there is, even among Democrats, uh, a, a, a lot of hesitation to in any way put this situation in framing that would lead to accountability under international law. 
Um, in terms of what it means for the Palestinians, of course, uh, this can lead to very significant consequences because it is essentially a green light that, that forces on the right in Israel can use uh, to uh, move forward with continued settlement expansion, accelerated settlement expansion, and of course, annexation, uh, which is something that uh, I would say the vast majority of the Israeli political spectrum represented by their parties today is behind in one way or the other. Uh, the opposition party to Netanyahu has said that they support a permanent Israeli presence uh, in the West Bank and the majority of the settlement blocks and in the Jordan Valley, which amounts to uh, somewhere near 60 percent of 62 uh, percent of, of, of the occupied West Bank, um, to, to say nothing of, of Jerusalem, which is, of course, occupied as well. Um, so, you know, I think th there's, there's very significant consequences that we, we may see down the line. That is, of course, tied to whatever ends up happening in Israeli politics. Uh, we know now that the prime minister has been indicted. We don't know what sort of impact that this is going to have. Um, but uh, again, uh, this is bigger than Netanyahu. Uh, annexationism uh, in Israel is bigger than Netanyahu. It is much deeper than Netanyahu, and it's much broader than just the Likud party uh, and, and the allies on the right as well. Uh, the idea that Israel will retain a permanent control of the West Bank in some form or another is not simply advanced uh, by what is characterized as the right. What openings does this uh, provide, if any? Um, I think for Palestinians, it provides an opening to engage with the international community to take further steps for accountability uh, around the lines uh, of uh, enforcing international law when it comes to the settlements. There is a growing uh, wedge uh, between Europe and the United States that has been exacerbated by the Trump administration when it comes to this question. I think we saw that on display at the United Nations Security Council. And I think there's an opening here for Palestinians to engage with European partners, which recently, of course, we saw the uh, court decision in Europe around labeling of Israeli settlements uh, to push for further and stronger Israeli policies when it comes to um, economic costs uh, for, uh, you know, uh, Israeli settlement uh, activity. Uh, on the domestic side here in the United States, I think there are also opportunities for people to use this to engage with those who are not part of the Trump base uh, and really begin to demand that accountability politics is a necessary component of any advocacy and any work on U.S. policy uh, towards Israel and, and Palestine. And I think that um, there is a ripeness today because of where our domestic politics are, because of the partisan nature of things, and because of a, 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 a burgeoning sympathy for Palestinians among progressives and among the left wing here in the United States uh, to begin demanding that actions follow words uh, as well, that it's not simply enough to have 106 Democrats on a letter saying, you know, we see them as illegal. Uh, we need to hear more and more official voices from that side of the spectrum, at least to start, to begin saying they're illegal, they've been illegal for a long time, we've been subsidizing them consistently, that needs to stop. There needs to be accountability. And I think you're starting to see now in the conversation, the political conversation among candidates for uh, the White House, uh, that there is more and more appetite for talking about uh, accountability in one form or another, whether it's conditioning uh, aid to Israel or, or otherwise. So there is, there is space, I think, that this creates to do further advocacy uh, for accountability uh, on, uh, on the domestic side. Um, and, and I'll stop there. All right. Thanks, Yusuf. Lara? Sure. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you all for coming. Um, it is horrible speaking after my two colleagues here because they covered a lot of ground, and they did so um, rather brilliantly. Um, I'm going to just come in with some observations, which I think I'm trying not to go over things that have already been gone over. The, the first observation I have is that even in this conversation, we continue to do what people have been doing for the past three years, which is talk about this administration as if it's a normal administration. If you engage this administration or analyze them as a normal, pragmatic administration that is just somehow to the right or in a different place doing different things, what that means is you will consistently fail to understand what they are doing, and you will misdiagnose what they will do next. 
This administration is exactly what it says it is. It's been telling us what it is since before it came on board. And on Israel-Palestine, it has been coherent and consistent since before this president took office with the same circle of people around the president. This has been one of those areas when people say this president is reckless and he's all over the place. On Israel-Palestine, this administration has been like, a, like an arrow since before they even took office. And if you listen to what they said from before they took office to the present, what they said was international law is irrelevant in this conflict. They take a perspective which is entirely and unapologetically ideological, which says this land, all of it, belongs to Israel, belongs to the Jews, the Palestinians are illegitimate, their claims are illegitimate, they're not a real people, they're not a real partner, and our policy is to undo everything that has happened from Madrid forward and return us to an era when the Palestinians' claims are not considered. And that's what they've been doing systematically. So, you know, this week I, w I was on the ground, I was in Jerusalem when the, um, well, first I was in Jerusalem when the European um, court decision on labeling came up. And I, all of us were like, ooh, yay, because that could have that been bad. Um, and it came up and I said to friends, there is going to be a concrete U.S. response. I can't say for certain whether the Pompeo announcement was in response to the political cycle in Israel. I will tell you that I'm dubious. In Israel, the Pompeo announcement just didn't hit with much noise. Nobody cared that much. The people who care about this the most talked about it. This wasn't something the Israelis were taken with. They're much more taken with, will Gantz be able to form a government? Will he give back the mandate? Will the Gaza stuff heat up again? There were lots of much bigger things going on. This wasn't it. And this wasn't going to make or break whether Gantz was able to form, whether there was a, a unity government, or whether Bibi would be indicted. What the, European, what the European decision did, however, was provide a catalyst for what was clearly the next thing on this administration's agenda, which is taking the next thing off the table. This administration came in saying, first off, they took Jerusalem off the table. And we can parse these statements. I'm fascinated, and with no disrespect, we all do it. We're in Washington. We're pragmatic analysts. We parse the words looking for meaning. You can parse the Jerusalem Declaration of this administration as much as you want. Very carefully written words. What mattered was a, the same day, I think, when Nikki Haley said the president's taken Jerusalem off the table, and about 24 hours later when that's how the president started to speaking. You can look at all the wonderful language David Satterfield wrote about how this is just recognizing realities on the ground. It doesn't prejudge permanent status. The president says, I took Jerusalem off the table. That David Friedman says he took Jerusalem off the table. That's the policy. They did it subsequently with refugees. UNRWA, we took Jerusalem, we took, we took refugees off the table. Let's remember, we've also taken the Palestinians as a people that we recognize and have relations with off the table. Throwing the PLO mission out of Washington and closing the consulate reduced the Palestinians back to a position where we treat them as if they are not, not just not a partner for peace, if the Palestinians want to talk to us, they now talk to us through our ambassador to Israel. We've reduced the Palestinians effectively to a people living under Israeli authority, right? Practically like Israelis, but not quite. Um, so systematically, bit by bit. And let's talk about prisoners just for a second, because it gets forgotten. Prisoners is not a permanent status issue. Why is prisoners not a permanent status issue? It's not a permanent status issue because it was so critical to the Palestinians that it had to be resolved before permanent status. Under Oslo, prisoners was supposed to have been resolved before we got to permanent status negotiations. Pre-Oslo, prisoners should have been released. This was supposed to be resolved under this administration with the, the bipartisan support of Congress. We have legislation which says the prisoner issue has now been put on the negotiating table and then it's been taken off permanently. Because now we say that if you talk about prisoners, if you support prisoners, their families, you're supporting terror. That's where we are. The only thing really left for them to do now is land, right? We've already changed policy on settlements, and my colleagues covered this already. It was changed at the moment this administration took office. We stopped any objections to settlements. Whatever the Pompeo statement was, we have not objected to settlement construction, expansion in any significant way. And this administration pretty quickly made clear, they, I, it's, it's bewildering to me. I go back at quotes from early on in the administration when there are people who should know better saying things like, 
well, come on, the president said, you know, it'd be better if you didn't, so it's just like the Obama administration. Bullshit. Sorry, I know we're on video. Bullshit. This has never been like the Obama administration, which was bad enough on settlements. This has been taking the absolute, any restraint away. But where can we go from there? If I am David Friedman, I will say David Friedman, I think, hates me. And that's fine. I think he no should, relation. no relation. David Friedman should love me because I think I may be the only person in Washington who gives him the respect he deserves. I take every word he says seriously. I do that because I learned that from the settlers. Take them seriously. They mean what they say. They're very clear. All the land in their view belongs to Israel. David Friedman speaking at APAC last year spoke in the tones of someone in church preaching. How will we look, how will we face our children if we don't realize everything while we have the most pro-Israel president in history? The only thing left to do here is to say that Israel has a right to keep the West Bank. That's the only thing left that they can really deliver between now and the next presidential election. I think the statement we saw this week from Pompeo was the opening, our, the opening shot at shifting to that policy. I think we'll see, the, oh, we'll see the next shot between now and the 2020 elections. And if you want to parse the language, what's interesting for me in parsing the language is you could predict. You know, I, I went and read the Pompeo statement after the fact, and I said, this is great. I could have written this because it is a, a hybrid of the US statement rationalizing our Jerusalem policy. If you go back and look at it, we said we're recognizing facts as they are, recognizing realities, which is just being, come on, how can we make peace if we don't recognize realities? Recognizing historic and a religious connection to the land. Right? That's the Jerusalem argument. Golan argument, let's talk international law, the law of the jungle. With our Golan policy, which is a clear and firm policy that has been rearticulated multiple times by this administration, we have articulated a view that land that is taken in a defensive war can be kept, period. Pompeo, when he was testifying in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee not long ago, scoffed at the idea that any rational person could disagree with this. How can you ask people to give back land that's been used to attack them? You combine those two, you have already in place a policy which says that Israel gets to keep any or all of the West Bank if they so choose. And that's what this is the beginning of. We need to take them at their word. These are ideologues. And until we understand that, no discussion of, well, the implications for the world and law of the jungle, in the Israeli ideological mindset and the American Jewish right-wing and evangelical mindsets, it doesn't matter if the erosion of international law has knock-on effects that are bad for the world. All they care about is international law is barring the way for Israel keeping the land it wants. That means international law is the problem. It is impossible to reconcile greater Israel and the post-World War II liberal world order. They are not reconcilable. If you are David Friedman, I can't quote him directly, I'm guessing if I were in his mind, if I'm the settlers, I look at that and I say, this is an injustice. The US got to take land from the Indians. They got to do it because then it was allowed. Why aren't we allowed to? Europe got to benefit from all the colonies. Why can't we do it? I've argued with people on Twitter when I talk to them about how Israel holds people in the West Bank. And they say, well, in Puerto Rico, you can't vote. Israel has an ethnic democracy, too. I explain to them they don't mean Puerto Rico. They mean American Samoa, if they want the proper analogy. They want, as an analogy, the case of the greatest travesty of American democracy. But the argument effectively is, give us the most Effect, the, give us the historical precedent that will rationalize us doing what we want to do. And if it predates the post-World War II liberal world order, which came out in large part from the experience of the Holocaust, and you know, my grandfather and people like him saying, we have to have rules, because the law of the jungle doesn't work out well for people who often find themselves at the wrong end of the gun or the knife. But you can't have greater Israel with these set of rules. And what we are seeing here is a systematic policy to take down that world order, to take it down specifically in the context of Israel-Palestine. And if it has effects more broadly, let the chips fall where they may. And let's be clear, this is happening in the context of democratic recession everywhere, happening here and everywhere else. And this is something that cannot be 
our, our analysis as we look at this cannot just focus on the Israel-Palestine piece of this. The impacts of what happens on Israel-Palestine absolutely echo further. But what's happening in Hungary, you know, I, I saw the, 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 was it Glenn Beck who had the cartoon of uh, George Soros puppeting? This, this is echoing all over the world in different ways, and it's, all, it's, it's not disconnected. In terms of what happens next, I think folks need to, and this is not me being pessimistic. I've, I've been accused over the past three years of being very pessimistic. And it's frustrating to be saying, here are facts. The facts are what they are. The facts are not pessimistic. The facts are what they are. It is not optimistic to ignore the facts. It is self-deluding. I think folks need to be looking at the facts and preparing themselves for an acceleration in this kind of policy. And if they're looking for ways to deal with it, and I want to really, really double down on what, what Yusuf just said, the goal can't be to say, OK, how do we get past this and return to status quo ante? For a couple of reasons. One, well, three reasons. One, it's a good chance Trump is going to be reelected. So if you're thinking we rush to return to status quo ante at the next election, well, that's going to get just if he gets reelected, you, you have no policy, no, no approach. So that's a little scary, if that's your thinking. Two, if you could return to status quo ante, status quo ante sucked. That's how we got here. Status quo ante, not just under Obama, although Obama put a very sharp edge on it by combining the best possible intentions with the worst possible implementation, which allowed us to have a regression in our Israel-Palestine policy like we hadn't seen in the previous 20 years. But beyond that, Point number three, there is no status quo ante to return to. There are changes that have been made that cannot be rolled back, whether it's because of political will. I think I can say as an assertion, no one is going to move the embassy back to Tel Aviv. And people say, well, but they could open the consulate in Jerusalem. I'd like to talk to you about that. Maybe they can. I don't know if Israel would give agreement for that, because there has to be a diplomatic facilities agreement. And I would point out, people don't know this, a lot of people don't know it. Every foreign ops bill, every appropriations bill since Oslo has contained a provision in it barring the U.S. from spending a dime to create a new facility in Jerusalem to talk to the Palestinians. It's like Congress couldn't prevent the consulate from talking to the Palestinians because it's already there, but that's been in every foreign ops bill since Oslo. Maybe a, maybe a new Congress would roll that back. I don't know. There are structural, there are structural obstacles to return to status quo ante, even if you wanted to go there, and they are in law and they are, in bipart they are bipartisan, and they are continuing to be added every day, every year, let's say. So, so as we look ahead, and again, I'm going to associate myself with Yusuf's comments, I think we have to look more at the grassroots, at the changes that are happening at the popular level here, at the changes in Europe. Um, one of my colleagues in Jerusalem is fond of saying that Trump has done a great job, Trump and Bibi, of, uh, of, of, of putting What's the language they use? Using the Palestinian issue to put the to force the U.S. and Israel into abject isolation, right? It's going to be the U.S. and Israel and a few islands, you know, Micronesia, um, and nobody else standing with them. And the latest vote at the U.N. with Canada is really interesting, having Canada even shift their approach. Um, where that goes, I don't know. But I think I'm going to end with this. Folks have to be clear-eyed. Making arguments about, well, they can't do this, they shouldn't do this, because these, will, these negative impacts for US interests, for restarting peace talks, for their peace plan, nobody cares about that. The folks making policy in this administration don't care about that. They don't even really talk about a peace plan anymore. They now talk about a vision. In Israel and Palestine, everyone I talked to kept using the term deal of the century. And I kept you know, kind of listening and saying, are you using that sarcastically? I mean, because nobody talks about that in this administration anymore. They haven't really used deal of the century since the very beginning. That is not the plan here. The plan here is to roll it back to where there are no Palestinians and then say, now that we have enabled Israel to once and for all win the 1967 war, or win the 48 war, depending how you think about it, and completely defeat the Arabs who are against the creation of Israel in its historic land, once we've let Israel truly win that war, now we can craft a new way forward. That's what they're doing. And once you recognize that, we can start grappling with what we can do in response. I'll stop there. Um, Mike says, with the numerous Israeli settlements, does the recent event now favor the one-state solution? And with the Arab population growing faster than the Jewish population, is that now 
um, an advantage for the Palestinians, that he's addressing his question to um, all panelists. Any one of you would like to start? I mean, I, I will start by, who's, who's that? Mike? Is Mike, where is Mike? So, so thank you, Mike, for your question. Um, I will start by saying we have a one-state reality on the ground. This is undeniable. It has only become further and further entrenched with every passing day. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone who has spent time on the ground there would be able to really make an authentic and very original case for how you unscramble the egg. Uh, it is extremely, extremely hard to imagine that. And it requires a degree of political will that is non-existent today. Certainly, certainly on the Israeli side, and especially here in the United States, where the United States would have to play a role of, of pressing the Israelis into that process. Um, that leaves you with a one-state reality that's very different than a solution. Um, and I think the, the, the question is, at what point do we have more of a conversation about a post-two-state alternative and how U.S. policy towards whatever that alternative is? aligns with stated U.S. values about democracy, about equality, about uh, the rule of law and equality before the law, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, so on and so forth. Um, if you look at the situation on the ground today, and, and you know, this is where the previous administration left off. And uh, you know, at the end of 2016, with their, with their abstention on the United Nations Security Council, 2334, was accompanied by a lengthy speech by Secretary of State Kerry at the time, who said, look, this is the future that we're looking at. We're looking at a future where between the river and the sea, there are about 13 million people. It's, it, the majority is not Jewish, and yet it is uh, you know, uh, a Jewish state that is dominating over the lives of these millions of people, ruled by a military, who have no, no self-determination, no right to vote for the government that's ruling them. Whatever you want to call that, it conflicts with U.S. values. And he, at the time, used separate and unequal. You know? uh, and I think, um, uh, I think that when we get to the, the, the point, and I think we're increasingly getting there, and every step that the Trump administration is taking, I think, is shattering the, even the, the, the last believers that exist in, in a, in a two-state outcome, um, it's forcing a new conversation to happen. How that translates into policy is, is a much, much bigger, longer question. Um, but I think it's undeniably forcing a different conversation. Yeah. Just to add, I just came back from, from almost from 10 days of meeting with folks on the ground, Israeli and Palestinian NGOs and activists. And what was striking for me in this visit is how quickly, or not quickly, I mean, we are definitely in a moment of shifting the discussion to discussion of apartheid. The word apartheid came up in every conversation I had. And whether it was people talking about trying to assess very specifically the legal definition of apartheid and how much the increasingly open Israeli discussion of annexation sh forces them into that. Because right, the main argument against calling it apartheid, one of the main arguments is that this is temporary and if there's a peace process. At the point when Israel's talking about really our plan is to keep it all, it's just a matter of exactly how much and when and, and when we'll do it. Um, Pretty much everybody I engaged with was talking about the fact that this is where this is this discourse is shifting to, because that's where the politics and the poli that that's where the situation is today. Very briefly, uh, I totally agree. I think that uh, uh, we have been amiss the the paradigm of two state uh, language and narrative. Uh, which in large part continues because of international law, uh, because we are so comfortable with the international law aspects of it, has prevented us from having the very painful and very serious discussion which we need to start having about what is the nature of the one state which already exists. How, how is that going to happen? Uh, it's, it's amazing, about five years ago, just a quick anecdote, uh, I, I met Thomas Dine from uh, APEC, and I said, oh, by the way, uh, what's APEC's position these days? He says, two states. Oh. Very quickly, two states, because for him, that was the salvation. That's, why, that's how you can avoid the difficult conversation 
that, that we all need to engage in. And I have to say, on the Arab side as well, it's going to be a difficult and painful conversation. And people have been desperately avoiding it, but I don't think we can anymore. Uh, thanks to the right wing in Israel and thanks to President Trump, we are now being forced to have that conversation. Can I just add one last thing on, on, on this point? The last party of the three that still officially speaks about a two-state solution are the Palestinians, right? The Israelis, are, you know, are very clear about where they stand. Trump said one state, two state, whatever, and we can clearly see from the policy where uh, it's going, as, as Laura yeah. very much laid out. Should you have a change, uh, you, can, you can see a very quickly shifting conversation. And in many ways, it is the, the Palestinians that are the leadership, uh, is the last that is keeping this boogeyman uh, alive. Uh, and I think should, should that change, it would take away that safe space. It would take away that safe space that, that Mr. Diamond you know, displayed, and also the safe space that the international community is hiding in, whether it's Europe or, or, or elsewhere. We have a related question from Neda Shaheen. Um, she says, as a decision on settlements is made by the president, and international law has proven to be ineffective, as you've all kind of alluded to, um, what concrete steps should, could be taken to push against this policy? Or in, in a broader sense, um, if we're in a position where international law is ineffective and not implemented, what are the, the options? Uh, so I guess everyone's looking at me here to come up with an answer to this. Look, I think, uh, I, I think what it comes down to is power, you know, and, and it's not that international law is not effective. It's very effective when it is applied with power and with the folks that have power and the direction that they want to apply it. Uh, but that's not what's happening right now. What we need to do is, is change that power equation. And I think um, one of the ways, certainly, that Palestinians have been calling for uh, to do that is for, for civil society actors to engage in the ways that they can uh, to call for accountability in the institutions in which uh, they are a part through boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And to create a groundswell of support at the grassroots level that will eventually tra translate uh, to the kind of policy change at the state level that uh, will have the backing of power to ultimately implement international law. Um, it, it's a long game. This is not, you know, this is not a quick thing. We have to be very realistic about the power dynamic, as, I, as, as Laura encourages us to be. Um, but it's, it's hard to see alternatives to that, and I, I think it's one of the reasons why Palestinians have been so laser-focused on boycott, divestment, and strategy, uh, sanctions as a strategy, because all the other alternatives have led us to this point, whether it's negotiations or armed struggle or whatever else. We, we are here because of that, uh, and, and the civil society approach is a, is, is a response to it. I, I, I don't want us to give up on international law. It's still powerful. It's still important uh, for our species as human beings. We cannot live in a jungle. We have to accept some form of international law. Uh, it's, it's, it's just not possible anymore I mean, by the end of the Second World War, people from all over the world with different ideologies realized you can't just rely on power. You have to have some rules. You have to have some institutions. You have to have some standards. You have to have some values. And, and even though I know it's, it's uh, for us uh, Palestinians particularly, we like to say <laughs> international law, it means nothing. It means a lot. The world lives by international law, even though it's not always applied, and in our case, we say it's not applied at all. The reality is international law does exist. International norms and values do exist. Even when they are violated, you can see that they are being violated. Now, I, I use Syria as an example. Uh, Syria is a place where international law of warfare in terms of attacks on uh, uh, attacks on uh, health uh, places, use of uh, poison gas, use of uh, starvation as a weapon, all of these things are against international law. But they are so clearly 
denounced by everybody that each side is claiming that the other one is using these things, which means everybody accepts that that is the standard. These things no longer are acceptable. As, as a race, human beings no longer accept these forms of warfare. So don't give up on international law just yet. Just to add very quickly, so Yusuf and I were on a panel at the Palestine Center a week, two weeks ago, and this came up as well. And, and Yusuf made a point which I think is really important to remind people of, which is that however you feel about it, boycotts, divestment, sanctions, those three words, each of those is a tactic, right? Yes. And it's not, a, it's not an end unto itself. The idea is how do you put pressure? And it's become something that's known as a proper name movement. The bottom line is there are a number of tactics available to try to pressure states, pressure governments, pressure politicians. And those are three of the ones that have been proven. Um, and they have been respected. And it's only in the context of Israel-Palestine that they have become demonized. It's, it's quite striking. Um, when folks talk about what they can do, it isn't merely like, OK, do I want to boycott? It, this, uh, personally, I don't personally boycott Israel. I don't. I'll go to the mat for the right of anybody who says they want to for political reasons. That is your free speech. Boycott, divestment, test sanctions, are, this is free speech. If this is what you want to do, you need to defend it, and we all need to defend your right to do it. Beyond that, though, if you look at how this is playing right now, I talked about the recession, the democratic recession. Um, and this is something Yusuf can talk about from some personal experience as well. If you recall, not that long ago, Congress passed a resolution um, denouncing BDS, which is outrageous. It's just outrageous. It was, it was an outrageous resolution. But even if you don't think it was that outrageous, you're OK you know, name calling members of Congress who want to take these positions. In parallel, we saw a resolution introduced that was just a generic, a generic validation of boycotts as a tool of protest. Right? This should have gotten every member of Congress from both party on it without any question. Both sides say they protect free, they, they, they defend free speech. Both sides say this is, you know, whether they want to do it for whichever cause. This should not be controversial. That resolution is dead. It has only Democrats on it. It has only a tiny number. And almost all of them are either Black Caucus or Hispanic Caucus. Progressives won't go near it. Because today, in this liberal, this Democratic recession era, to merely assert the right to boycott in general is now being framed as anti-Israel and anti-Semitic. Right? you got to stand up. This isn't just about Israel-Palestine. I keep saying to people, even if you don't care about Israel-Palestine, Israel-Palestine cares about you and your civil rights. You got to stand up. Okay, we have a related question. There's no name, but um, since you mentioned the um, weaponization of anti-Semitism against um, some of the uh, activism, uh, the question is: How will you respond to claims that the U.S. progressive left is anti-Semitic? And probably you can't really generalize about the U.S. progressive left, but this question says. Um, those who assert illegality of settlements are anti-Semitic. This is another claim. Would any of you like to respond? What was the last piece? Those that who assert the How illegality would you respond? of settlements are anti-Semitic? Yeah. Uh, I'll go first. I, will, I, I am the Jewish person on this panel, and I think this is most. I think this is largely something for the Jewish. The Jewish community is is fighting about internally. Um, I will say objectively, I'm on Twitter. I get horrible things all the time at me. There are anti-Semites on the left, on the right on the margins of craziness, in the center of normalcy, they're anti-Semites. That doesn't mean, it, sorry? In the White House. In, yeah, they're anti-Semites everywhere. This is, this, is not, this is a difficult time, and anti-Semitism is surging. This is, I, I did not imagine that at this point in my life we'd be having people shooting up synagogues in the United States. That's quite striking. However, the argument that the progressive left is anti-Semitic is outrageous. It is offensive. And it is clearly an effort to stifle political views. We, we, the, the, there's the, the, the conflation of criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism is incredibly powerful and incredibly convenient. And frankly, and I got to say this to this audience as the Jewish person on this panel, is something that I think we in our community um, bear most of the weight of trying to push back on. I would say, talking to activists who are not Jewish, you, you have a tremendous burden put on you when you speak, because people will examine you even more closely to find anti-Semitism. 
And as we know, watching members of Congress who speak out, particularly members of Congress who are of color and maybe female of persuasion and possibly Muslim, um, it doesn't matter what they say, it seems. It will be parsed it's somehow to be anti-Semitic. And it is, again, the onus, I think, falls even more on people in, in my community to push back on that. Um, but this conflation is cynical. And in an era when literally the people who are saying, I am standing up against liberal anti-Semitism are the people who are fueling classical lethal anti-Semitism that is lethal and growing, it is, it is reprehensible and historically irresponsible. I just want to add that I, I really appreciate Laura's comments and perspective and, and talking about the importance of um, the role of people in the Jewish community, you know, um, speaking out about the conflation of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism and criticism of Israel and all of that. Um, I, I do also want to know that, you know, it's, it's a little over a year ago now that a white supremacist walked into a synagogue in Pittsburgh uh, and murdered 11 worshipers uh, on, on a Sabbath day. And when you look at what was behind that person's ideology, the reason that he targeted that synagogue in particular was because that synagogue was working uh, with the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, uh, which uh, he blamed for bringing uh, brown and black people into this country, and Muslims in particular, uh, including into places, uh, Somali immigrants, into places like Minnesota, which is uh, a district that is represented today uh, by, by Representative Ilhan Omar uh, in, in Washington, D.C. I think what, what this teaches us, and there's a very important lesson in here that, that um, for those of us who are not part of the Jewish community, um, is that we need to continue to remind people, make the argument that anti-Semitism is, yes, a distinct and unique phenomenon, but also is part of various forms of bigotry that target all communities, uh, and that is weaponized uh, in this way um, to target lots of different minorities by folks who are coming from a, a white nationalist and majoritarian worldview uh, that doesn't see very much difference between Jews and Muslims and uh, brown and black and, you know, and, and, and everything else across the spectrum if you're not a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, and so it's very important for us not just to, as, as non-Jewish members of the global community to denounce anti-Semitism, but also speak in a universalistic voice in response to the uh, rising right-wing nationalism uh, that wants to see all of these different communities divided up and persecuted. Okay. Um, going back to um, the international community, we have a question from Molly uh, at Anira. Our she says, we frequently discuss these decisions in terms of how it affects the U.S.'s role in the peace process. But does the U.S. truly have enough respect or a decent enough reputation within the international community to play any sort of role in a peace process? Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, think that one, one of the things we need to remember about international law is that every country in the world even when they are pretending not to care, do in fact care about international law and about the, the opinion of others. Uh, even North Korea, even China, uh, even the United States, they do care. They pretend, they bluster, the politicians bluster and say, I don't care what the rest of the world thinks. You know, we are number one, we are powerful, we are, uh, as Israeli politicians, for example, always, you know, uh, assert with arrogance, doesn't matter what the Gentiles do, uh, it's what we Jews do. What they say doesn't matter, what we do is what matters. Uh, but every, every regime, every dictator, every country, even when it's pretending it doesn't care about international law, does in fact care about international law and can, in fact, be influenced uh, in international law. I'll just add a, I'm going to just challenge the framing of the question. This administration doesn't care about the peace process. It doesn't. The peace process is over. It's done. It was a bad dream. Um, you know, I, was, I was talking to someone today earlier. It's, I think if folks think about this, think about like the people who oppose Roe versus Wade. 
You just take a second. Think about somebody who ideologically believes that there is never any possible, wait, there's never any reason for abortion. There's never any justification because every, every sperm is sacred, every embryo is a child that God wants to come into existence. When the Supreme Court dropped Roe versus Wade, they didn't say, well, we're sad, it's over, we'll go on and do something else. They spent decades re working at the local level, at the state level, remaking courts, remaking laws, remaking state houses, until they got to the point where we are very possibly going to see Roe versus Wade overturned this year. That's what's driving our Israel-Palestine policy. Nobody, I don't think anyone in a position to make policy in this administration cares about something called the peace process. What they believe is that we don't have to ask permission, not interested, we're not going to look for forgiveness, we're going to do it, and the world will accept it, because they don't have a choice. And the question is whether that is true. Um, and I think the, the, the jury's out. I do think international law is important, particularly if you're in Europe and your borders are really, really close and people have short memory, long enough memories to remember what happen when, happens when borders are violated. I think the jury is still out on how much there will be resistance to this. But this administration seems to think that they can bowl straight through um, and the process is over. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that it took us as human beings to see some of the, the the most horrific uh, acts of, of violence and genocide to understand the importance of a rules-based order. Uh, and hopefully, uh, God forbid, it won't take uh, that, that kind of descent into chaos and violence and, and murder for us to once again understand the value of it. Um, but I, I wanted to just add in response to this uh, question that, no, of course, the United States now is probably at a lower point in terms of credibility on uh, addressing uh, the you know, Israeli-Palestinian issue that at any point uh, before. If there's a way to go below zero in credibility, I think they're there. Uh, I don't think the peace process exists anymore or is coming back. That does not change the fact, the very important fact, that the U.S.-Israel relationship is the single most important strategic asset for the state of Israel and the single most important thing enabling Israeli behavior towards the Palestinians. Uh, so I think the, the real question is, what do we do about that? How, how do we change that, even if the United States doesn't have credibility, even if the United States can't lead a peace process, even if that's all a, a, a myth? How do we address the fact that the United States is in the way, more in the way than anyone else? Even when the international community wants to get involved, the United States makes sure to get in the way. Um, I, I tell people all the time, uh, there's horrible things going on on the ground in Israel-Palestine. This is the arena where change needs to happen before change can really happen on the ground. Because we have a tremendous amount of leverage that can be brought to bear if we actually want to do that. OK, we have a question from Isaac, a reporter with the American Prospect. Um, he says that the date of the century, in quotes, was obviously a farce historically. At what point did US talk of a two-state solution or peace become a fig leaf? And I think many of you mentioned it already, but would you like to add anything? Just, I, I don't, I don't want to just keep hitting this point over and over. If you actually believed the people around President Trump, David Friedman had a column, a regular column in Aret Sheva, which is the settler-oriented news outlet in Israel, an English-language column. He is on the record copiously making clear that he doesn't believe in the two-state solution. And when he was, when President Trump was elected, I had friends tell me, well, it doesn't matter. He's just a kibitzer. He's just a, now they're going to bring in real people. And then they nominated him as, 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 as uh, ambassador. And people said, well, but he's going to have to follow US policy. And if you watch his, his hearing, his confirmation hearing, and they're going round and round, partly because people like me provided the senators with all of this, this here's what he said. I'm not giving you any opinions of mine. Here's his own words. Challenge him. And at one point, I think it was, it was one of the Republican senators, the chairman, I think, said that he was having a hard time believing that this, this nominee in front of him was basically swearing off everything, all of his deeply held beliefs, and how could it be serious? And Friedman said, no, no, I am serious. OK, well, if you want to accept that one statement and nothing that came before it, then you see what happens. Because he was, he was serious he, about what he feels. And, and, and we knew coming in, this administration was not serious about peace. 
One of the great problems I have, and you hear a little bitterness in my voice, I think, probably, is that there is an industry of experts that I think, maybe mostly with good intentions, are unable to see past what they see as a pragmatic analysis of any administration. So if you go back starting from January of the year Trump came into office through the present, you will see over and over people explaining to you why it doesn't mean what it seems to mean. Don't believe what they're saying. It's just like Obama on settlements. The Jerusalem announcement is meaningless. They'll never move the embassy. You can just, just recite them. Take them at their word. They mean what they say and they have all along. Uh, we have a couple of questions about um, Arab countries and their role in this. Um, question from Jacob with Associated Reporters. Um, he says, shouldn't Egypt um, help make this possible? Well, didn't Egypt make help, <laughs> help make this possible? Um, I think referring to the um, tabling a UN uh, resolution about the settlements early on. Um, what can Arab states do, especially Jordan, um, I think a couple of other countries listed here, Egypt. Uh, we have a, another question from Hillary about Saudi Arabia, uh, saying that Saudi Arabia and Israel appear to be strengthening their relations. In your opinion, what impact um, this has on the situation um, in Palestine? And um, should Saudi Arabia take a more visible or vocal stance against the um, announcement regarding the settlements? question, not a legal question, but I think I can uh, say with confidence that uh, the Arab governments, uh, without exception, maybe Tunisia is, is currently an exception, but, but each of the Arab governments uh, pursues the interests of its leaders rather than its people. The peoples of every Arab country, without exception, are supportive of the Palestinian people, are supportive of international law, certainly, are supportive of the Arab peace plan, which requires a removal of all the settlements uh, in, in the context of a two-state solution. Uh, but none of these countries the elites or the regimes or the rulers have any interest in uh, paying a price for such a policy or in uh, opposing the United States or in uh, pursuing uh, the interests of their own population uh, within their countries, much less uh, to do it uh, for, the, for the sake of the Palestinians. Uh, so. Uh, I think until the Arab world becomes more democratized and more responsive, its rulers become more responsive to its populations, I don't think they're going to provide much help or support to the Palestinians uh, or to international law. Yeah, I, I would say that I think one of the things that this administration tried to do um, uh, is change uh, the sequence uh, involved in the Arab Peace Initiative uh, as part of you know what what has been called the outside in approach or the new Middle East or, or, or whatever and the sequence in the Arab Peace Initiative for those who are not familiar are here are the uh, here are the requirements uh, from the Arab side uh, for a, uh, a peace between Israelis and Palestinians uh, if this criteria is met then the Arab states will take steps to build full diplomatic relations, normalization uh, with the state of Israel. This was um, initiated by uh, the, the Saudis at the time, endorsed by the entire Le Arab League, endorsed by the entire organization of is the Islamic Conference, which, which maybe now changed its name. I don't remember exactly what it is now. Um, but, the, but, but the OIC at the time, which represents 57 Arab and Muslim countries. And so Israel had an opportunity to, to uh, have, by complying with international law, which was the requirements in there as it, as it, as it relates to the, to the terms, uh, to have full and normalized relations with 57 Arab and Muslim countries uh, if, if, if it was able to follow through with these uh, requirements and achieve a peace based on, on international law with, with the Palestinians. 
what this administration has tried to, to do uh, in, in support of this fantasy in some policy circles is uh, reverse this order uh, and to create a, a set of normalized relations between Israel and a variety of Arab states for the purpose of getting to an agreement with the Palestinians, not of course on the basis of international law, but on the basis of full and total Palestinian submission. Uh, and I think they have tried uh, in, in various uh, ways and with various different regimes to push that forward and have found that uh, even with the most compliant regimes, the ones who have been most willing to wheel and deal with the Trump administration, uh, that even they are uh, unable to move behind a greater degree of flirting uh, with normalization than where they are. Uh, I think this goes back to a, a, a fundamental problem with this idea, and that is that you know you can you can make peace between regimes, you can make peace between governments. Ultimately, governments have to sign agreements, but peace cannot be made unless there are peace between people. Uh, and I think when you look at where Arab publics are, uh, and I think the Arab Center has done a tremendous amount of uh, polling, probing these specific questions. What you see is the overwhelming majority of Arab publics oppose the idea of their governments having normalized relations with the state of Israel without there being a just peace for the Palestinians. Uh, and so, you know, the, the folks in the White House uh, may want to make their weapons deals with, uh, you know, certain regimes in the region, and those regimes may not care too much about what popular sentiment actually is. But when the rubber hits the road at the end of the day, um, those regimes are going to come up increasingly uh, to dissent from Arab publics if they were ever to try to go that route. And I think that's why they, they are still holding to that line. Not out of any special uh, reverence for international law or for, or for the Palestinians in particular, but because they understand that this is uh, not something that can be dealt with uh, lightly or easily dismissed. Thanks, Yusuf. And um, I'll just mention what Yusuf is, is referring to um, in terms of the polling is um, the Arab, Arab Opinion Index, which uh, we do. Uh, it's a polling of um, Arabs in different Arab countries about their uh, views of U.S. policy. You can find that on our website if you're interested, um, arabcenterdc.org. I'll end with, with a question um, regarding uh, international solidarity. And this question refers specifically to the South African government. But I would like to ask in general, are we seeing or do we expect to see changes, um, not only on the grassroots level, but by governments uh, in, in the way they deal with Palestine, Israel? And I'll give each of you a minute to, to answer and give some final remarks if you'd like. Yusuf? I mean, the only thing I would say in, in relation to this with the, with the, the South Africa um, uh, analogy is it's important for folks to keep in, in mind that with South Africa, the f we had enacted here in the United States comprehensive sanctions legislation uh, in the late 1980s. Um, the first uh, legislation that was introduced for sanctions on South Africa was introduced in 1971. It took uh, well over 15 years to get to the point where you had a resolution that was introduced with a single co-sponsor to a point where you had a uh, where you had a bill that could pass with a veto-proof majority in the late 1980s that would not have that that didn't happen because members of congress woke up one day and said you know we really should do something about this right that happened because people at the grassroots level pushed they built coalitions they built relationships they built relationships with people who look differently than them and their normal partners. They built with people who understood the importance of solidarity and understood the importance of the rights of the oppressed, even if they didn't necessarily come from the African-American community, right? Or they didn't come from the African community. Um, so I think that is the biggest lesson to take here is that, yes, change can happen. Change will take time the path may very well be a long one on this one and longer than it was even on South Africa for there to be the kind of state level pressure that we need. None of that is possible without international solidarity, grassroots activism, and the work of civil society pushing the policy makers to take the kind of steps that they're not going to do on their own. So everything Yusuf just said, 
Um, I'd add that the Trump administration's actions do create interesting opportunities, right? So immediately after the announcement um, on settlements, we heard noise from some European capitals about whether or not it's time to recognize, right, recognize Palestine, which is an interesting question because recognition of Palestine from a European perspective is not just symbolic. It actually, then you can actually protest things differently. There's a whole range of, of possible actions that flow from that. Um, for me, I, I go to Brussels pretty regularly, and each time I go to Brussels, I feel like there's less resistance to the idea that maybe countries need to start thinking about their own bilateral policies as opposed to waiting either for the U.S. to lead and people can follow or waiting for an EU policy because an EU policy right now is, is impossible. I mean, as long as we saw what happened this week with Hungary blocking even an EU statement on settlements. Um, the, the, the individual countries do have their own equities here, right? They have their own interests, they have their own equities, and increasingly we are leaving an era when they can say, listen, the most responsible thing we can do is follow the lead of the United States, or the only thing we can do is act only as a coalition. So that opens up some interesting, um, interesting possibilities as well. Yeah. I, I, uh, I agree with uh, what, what you both said, uh, and I just want to emphasize the issue of solidarity and universal values. Palestine will not be free until other people are free, until people in the Arab world are free, until people in the third world are free, until the Europeans are free to pursue their own values and their own uh, beliefs. So uh, the struggle of the Palestinian people, I think, again, is moving into the situation where it was back in the 60s and the 70s, where it was the issue, not just for Palestine, but for everyone else. Uh, it's the nature of, of, of power and society that the, those who are in power will seek their own interests. And until ordinary people, civil society, uh, young people, students, uh, churches, uh, people of good uh, goodwill, who really care about human beings, until they become active and they become involved and they pressure their leaders, uh, we're not going to see any change. And, and I'm not giving up on that, because I think that that is, in fact, uh, the battle. It takes longer. It takes more work. You don't just sit in your house and you click likes and uh, on, uh, on your Twitter feed. You have to really go out in the streets and do something about it. But it can happen, and it will happen, because I think this is the nature of, of, of the progression of history and of uh, human advancement. And with that, we are out of time. Um, I would like to thank all three speakers for their great contributions. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And um, have a great weekend. Thank you.